Belfast Corporation bought uh, over 100 acres of land on the Falls Road in 1866. And they decided to use 40 acres of that land as a cemetery and the rest they used for the Falls Park. In planning out the cemetery, this cemetery was meant to be interdenominational. So Catholics and Protestants were meant to be buried here in this cemetery. So having made the decision that it was going to be interdenominational, 15 acres of uh, cemetery ground and a site for a mortuary chapel were given to the Catholics of Belfast. Before the cemetery opened in 1869, on the 1st of August 1869, a dispute arose between the Catholic Bishop of Down and Connor, uh, Patrick Dorian, and the Belfast Corporation. And essentially it was a dispute about Catholic canon law. For Catholics, a stillborn child, a suicide, someone who committed suicide, uh, someone who had been excommunicated, and the last category was someone who had bought a grave as a Catholic and then became a Protestant, would not be buried in Catholic blessed ground. And so then what happened is a dispute rumbled on for about six months, and eventually the bishop got £4,000 compensation, and he bought 15 acres of land across the road, which we know as Milltown Cemetery, and the council were relieved of their duty to bury the Catholics of Belfast. But in the planning of all of this, and before the dispute, the way they decided to separate out the Catholic blessed ground from the rest was to build a wall. But in this case, it was an underground wall. And what do you think is a path in this cemetery is in fact the line of the underground wall. It is still there to this day. It's six inches below the surface. And it runs to the depth of nine feet or the depth of a grave in this section. And it is probably the most famous feature of this cemetery today. In this grave you find uh, the remains of John Sinclair Boyd. Sinclair Boyd was a doctor and a gynecologist. But Sinclair Boyd uh, was a member of the Pipers Club of Dublin, an Irish speaker. And in every sense, I think he upends the stereotypes uh, that you think of our society or this cemetery as, say, being a Protestant cemetery. In that, Sinclair Boyd was the first president of the Belfast branch of the Gaelic League. And the Belfast branch of the Gaelic League was uh, founded by the Belfast Naturalist Field Club. So in that sense, he, he's not from the Falls Road or he, he, he's not from this community but he is a reminder of the links with uh, the Irish language and the Belfast Protestant community. This obelisk was raised in memory of Peter McKay, who is buried here. Peter was a member of the 93rd Regiment, and on his headstone you could see one of the thin red line. So Peter was a soldier at Balaclava during the Crimean War. And Peter represents the uh, long tradition in this cemetery of burying soldiers. So this is one of the earliest of the military graves here in this cemetery. This is the grave of Margaret Byers. Margaret was born outside Rothryland in 1832. And when she was 20, she married the Reverend John Bars. And the young couple then went as Presbyterian missionaries to Shanghai in China. When they were there, Margaret got two pieces of news. The first, that she was pregnant. And then on the day before her baby was born, she was told her husband was dying. So after the birth of their baby, they returned to Ireland. Now, Margaret organised this. So this is sailing across the Pacific, up the coast of South America to New York, and then across the Atlantic. But seven days out from New York, the husband died, and he's buried in Greenwood's uh, Cemetery in New York. Margaret came back to Ireland, stayed in Cookstown for a while, and then came to Belfast. Margaret Byers was passionate about the education of women, and so she uh, organized a school, founded a school in the center of Belfast. And we know that school today 
as Victoria College. So Margaret Byers, her contribution to Belfast is still continuing today in the number of young women highly educated coming out of Victoria College. But if you look at her stone, what you will see is she is described as the widow of the Reverend John Byers. Now, I think this is typically how women are wrote out of history. John Byers died 50 years before Margaret did, and yet uh, all her accomplishments, all her achievements, even today, the young women coming out of Victoria College educated, you don't see that on the stone. Her life is put in the context of John Byers, who died 50 years before she did. This is the plot of the Lewis family from Little Lee in East Belfast. And here lies the remains of Albert James Lewis. And over here, you have Florence Augusta Lewis. These are the parents of C.S. Lewis. Now, on a previous tour, I was speaking to some people from the East Belfast Historical Society, and they were telling me that opposite uh, the house where the Lewis family lived in East Belfast, there was a house that they used to visit. And in that house, there was a wardrobe that you could walk through. What might be mistaken for uh, green fields is in fact poor ground. Now there are about a quarter of a million people buried here in this cemetery. And 80,000 of those are buried in the poor ground. So this is poor ground. And so the practice was when they would open a grave and then they would wait for the grave to be filled and only then would they close the grave. And this, these patches here, there are thousands and thousands of poor people buried. And among those poor people are thousands and thousands of children who are buried in this poor ground. This is the family grave of the McCutcheson from the Donegal Road. If you look at the grave, there are eight children remembered uh, on this stone, 21 months, 11 and a half months, four and a half, seven months, 18 months, seven years, six months, 18 months. This is a reminder, the stone, of the vulnerability of children in Belfast, 19th century Belfast. I looked at the year when Margaret died. Margaret died in 1897. And I looked at the health uh, reports for 1897 in Belfast. And in a five week period in July, 1897, over 370 children died in this city. That's over 10 a day. And two thirds of those children were under the age of one. And this is a reminder of the vulnerability, you know, of children. It was flu, scarlet fever, German measles. All these diseases came regularly and they cut a swathe through the life of this city. And you can see it if you look at the census for those years in the number of children that died and each family, there sometimes would be two and three children died. There's a, uh, a grave over in Balmoral and there's a grave of a man who had 16 children, but half of them died. Now, why this is very uh, particular for us today is this is a reminder that uh, this is the life of our great grandparents and grandparents and our parents. They came through this without uh, healthcare, without the proper hospitals, without penicillin, and they survived it. And this was their experience. This was a common enough experience for our parents and grandparents, the death of children. This is a piece of public art erected by Belfast City Council. It's the flower forget-me-not. 
And I think it's very relevant in the context of the cemetery, of th those thousands of people who come into this cemetery every year to remember their loved ones. And in every sense, this flower, forget me not, captures their visits, and their sense a need to connect with their parents, grandparents, with their family who have passed away. Behind me is the bell yard. When I was growing up as a boy, there was a bell uh, contained within these walls. And every day it would ring and uh, alert those in the cemetery that the cemetery was closing. When I started to research this cemetery, I found out that the bell had come from the White Linen Hall after the White Linen Hall was demolished to make way for the Belfast City Hall. But in the 1970s, early 1970s, the bell was stole. So when I started to research the cemetery, I found out about the bell, where it had come from, the White Linen Hall. And I set myself the task of trying to find the bell. Eventually, I did find the bell. And now it's back in the care of Belfast City Council. And I would hope that someday, at the front gate, the bell will be erected again and, and it would ring out to tell people that the cemetery was closing. The other thing is, where I found the bell is a secret and will go to the grave with me. I have a theory of history. You always find what you're not looking for. So you never really know where a headstone is going to take you in terms of its history. So this is a classic example. This is Sadie Hale. Sadie was a typist on the Lusitania, which was sank by U-20 off the coast of Cork in 1915. And so there's a lot about the Lusitania. So I thought that was the end of the story. Now, the U-boat, U-20, that sunk the Lusitania was the U-boat that was allocated to bring Roger Casement to Ireland in 1916. It got out into the North Sea, broke down, and then had to be towed back to its base. Then U-19 was uh, given the task of bringing Roger Casement to Ireland. I thought that was the end of the story. No way. The captain of U-19 was the torpedo officer on U-20 that sunk the Lusitania. End of story? No way. Later I found out that the gun from U-19 is in Ward Park in Bangor. Here lies Robert John Welsh one of the great photographers of Belfast. In the 1890s, he was appointed by Harden and Wolfe to photograph all their ships as they were being built. So if you've seen a photograph of the Titanic or the Olympic, here's the man who took the photograph. This is the Herdman Stone. Herdman's of Sand Mills, very powerful mercantile family. And also uh, the Herdman's were members of the Harbour Board. This stone is called, its design is called Egyptian Revivalist because it's designed as the gate or the doorway of an Egyptian tomb. But I also think there's another level of design to find in this stone. And that is, it is the headstone of a 33rd degree Prince Mason. So the double-headed falcon at the top is the uh, symbol of a Prince Mason. This, the column is a Corinthian column, the Masonic symbol of beauty. The five sets of four rings, I think, are a representation of Jacob's letter. And the cosmos flower on the front of the stone is the eight-pointed star, the octagram. So there are two levels of uh, representation here. One, Egyptian revivalist, and then the other, Masonic.
This is the family grave of the Scott family. The Scott family were from the Donegal Road. And here you can see is the grave of Elisha Scott. Elisha played for uh, the Boys Brigade and then Broadway United and eventually ended up as goalkeeper for Liverpool. He was also goalkeeper for Ireland. And today he still holds the records of the number of matches of any player who played for Liverpool. In the 1930s, he came back to Belfast and became manager of Belfast Celtic. So on the headstone, you can see a Belfast Celtic badge and a Liverpool badge. So Elijah Scott really occupies a very special place in the history of soccer uh, in the early 20th century in this city. In this cemetery, you see the impact on inscriptions on headstones, family headstones of the First World War. I've catalogued over 250 stones that make reference to Belfast men and a few women who died in every theatre of war during the First World War. And this is one of their stones. It is a family headstone, but it's a, new, a very unique stone in that it's designed as a war grave in the shape of the cenotaph. And it remembers three soldier sons who died during the First World War. And if you look at the sides, what you will see are shells. So this is very unique. It is a family grave, but the stone is designed as a war memorial. So this cross brought me on a pilgrimage to Iona in the Hebrides. This is a half replica of St. Martin's cross outside the monastery on Iona. And the original cross is an 8th century cross. Look at the face of the stone. You can see snakes eating their own tails. This is a reminder that when Christians came to Ireland, they absorbed the beliefs of those who were already here. So we today think of the snake as evil, the devil. But in older times, the snake was seen as a symbol of regeneration. And a snake eating its own tail is, of course, either the sun or, or circular. It's never ended. And uh, it comes from a religious belief that is older than Christianity, but which is appropriated by those early cross makers and you find on the stones. So on this side, you've face, you've got the snakes eating their own tails. I want to bring you around to the other side of the stone. If you look at the face of the cross, you will see a mother and child on the beaded circle. That is typically cop. The cops were from North Africa. And as a reminder of the link between North Africa and Irish monasticism, then uh, you'll see on each side of the mother and child, you see a donkey. Look at the right hand donkey and its tail. There's a cross on its tail. Below that, the panel below the roundel, it's Daniel in the land's den. And then below that, it's Abraham and Isaac. Then there are representations of David playing a harp and a piper. And then representations of David below that. And again, the, the very uh, bottom panel is snakes eating their own tails. So, as I said, this stone led me to the island of Iona. This is the plot of the Ulster Female Penitentiary. The penitentiary started off in York Lane then moved to Brunswick Street and then eventually to the Ormer Road. We would know it today as a Magdalene laundry. There are seven women in this plot. In my view, they're meant to be anonymous. All you see is a small plaque that says the Ulster Female Penitentiary. You're not supposed, in my view, to know who's in this plot, but there are seven women. And why I think that they're meant to be anonymous when you read the reports of the female penitentiary, it says the penitentiary was for ex-prostitutes. 
You know, that term that denigrates women. So I think they're meant to be anonymous. So what I would like to do now is read out the seven names of the women who are buried here in this plot. Sarah Gillespie, who was aged 76 years. Jane Johnson, who was aged 38 years. Ellen Hoslett, and she was 61. Rosina Hawthorne, she was 65. Louisa Johnson was 30. Jane Madole was 50. And Agnes Shannon was 75 years old. It is important that we remember the lives of these women. In this plot lies Fred Crawford. We know him today as the gun runner who brought 25,000 rifles and 2 million rounds of ammunition into Larn Harbour in April 1914. Who would have thought that a very famous UVF gun runner would be buried here on the Falls Road? This is Vera Foster. He came to Ireland in 1847. He was the son of a diplomat and a diplomat himself. From the day and hour he came to Ireland, he spent his fortune for the benefit of the people who lived here on this island. His first task uh, was to travel with the famine Irish out to North America and to set up a network of support in Canada and the United States. He then came back to Ireland, was very interested in education, brought the teachers of Ireland together and made their report on education on Ireland. He personally financed the repair of many of the old national schools. We know him today for his copybooks. If you remember when your parents and grandparents were taught to write, they used these copybooks, you know, a stitch in time saves nine, and then they would copy it out. And they were taught uh, the style of their handwriting. It was, they used the copper plate. And it's because of this man here. And thousands of these copy books were published in Belfast, printed here in this city. One of the greatest uh, compliments I ever heard of Vera Foster was a young woman who was on the tour with me one day. Talk, she was a, a member of Concern and was in Pakistan. And she was telling me that they were using copies, photocopies of his copy books to teach kids how to read and write in English. This is the grave of the Reverend Robert Lynn. Robert came from Coleraine. His first congregation in Belfast, he was a Presbyterian minister, was in Academy Street. Then he moved to Barry Street, and then he moved to May Street, which is Henry Cook's old church. Robert spoke at the Great Unions Convention in 1892 in a motion in support of Southern Unionists. So he was a Unionist, Presbyterian. But I want also to talk about his son. And if you come round the other side of the stone, then we'll have a look at the inscription for his son, Robert Lynn. So this is the son of the Reverend Robert Lynn. And he was called Robert Lynn. He went to Inst. He was an Irish speaker, socialist and a Republican. And he was a member of the Dungannon Clubs in Belfast. He then went to London and he stayed with his friend, Paul Henry, the artist. And it was Robert Lynn who told Paul Henry that he should go and paint in the west of Ireland. But Robert was also political, a member of the Gaelic League. He was a friend of James Connolly and uh, wrote the introduction to Connolly's pamphlet, Labour in Irish History. When James Joyce married Nora Barnacle, they stayed with Robert Lynn uh, in London. He was also new Potter O'Donnell, a very famous IRA man from Donegal. So here you have the complexity of our history in this stone. There, I always say there is no them in us. There is only us and then layers of us. And here in this stone is a reminder that on one side, of course, you have a unionist. On the other side, you have a Republican and a socialist. This reminds us of the complexity of who we are. And we are enhanced by this sense of complexity. We are not diminished by it.
Off and on a tour, I will stop at this cross and remind those on the tour that each of us sometimes will have a day when we're feeling a bit precious. You know, the world is very dark. And then I say, you should come here to this cemetery and touch this stone. And why? This is Irish limestone. The sediment that laid down this stone was laid down 300 million years ago, somewhere about Antarctica. And with continental drift, it ended up as Irish limestone. And it is a reminder that we are only here for the flick of an eyelid. In this cemetery, there are a quarter of a million people buried. Each of those individuals has a story. So this cemetery is a great repository of Belfast history. It reminds us of the great and the good, of workers, of the poor, of women. You see all sorts of histories here in this cemetery. And it is a reminder of the complexity and uh, the power of the history of Belfast. And so when you visit Belfast City Cemetery, you're able to touch directly that powerful history.